Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 205-205. How you doing? How you feeling? People, how's it going? How are you this lovely sunny Thursday morning? Great. Good to know. And in case you're wondering, I'm feeling amazing too, man. Amazing too. La... Last night was a tough one. I went for a little five mile run. Um, I didn't go for a workout in the morning. Decided to do it in the evenings because I thought the weather would be cooler. But as you can tell from my uh, blocked up nose, it didn't really agree with me. Um, it ended up being, I think, I don't know if it's like the evening, the pollen sits or it comes, it gets lower to the floor or something. I don't know what happens with the pollen, but somehow in the evening, my allergies flared up a lot more than it would have done in the morning. So much so, I recognize my... my uh, the my allergies had flared up because when I was running outside yesterday during my little five minute five mile run, I say little to kind of humble brag, I noticed people were l- turning around and trying to check if someone was coming behind them, and then I noticed because you know I generally tend to run quite well, right? I have have good form. I usually run on my toes. I don't usually like stamp on the floor. I quite I try to keep it as smooth as possible. So I was realizing, okay, my breath is really fucked up. Like I'm I'm breathing quite wheezily, right? Or I'm like, you can tell that my throat is scratchy. Or as you can tell now, my nose is like, you know, a little bit stuffy or whatever. And I knew, all right, cool. My, my allergies are really flaring up. But the one thing that's flipped up about your allergies sometimes is that you don't get a symptom of sneezing or coughing too often. What you end up happening is you end up just like, your breathing ends up being a bit labored. And because I was pushing myself cardiovascularly, blah, 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 um, yeah, it resulted in a little bit of a peak situation. By the time I got back home, I was just like, you know, kind of dizzy, uh, again, wheezy, hot humid stuffy loads of other things all going on at once but you know i got the running that's the most important thing of the day i think um, i'm probably much better for it and today I'm gonna have a day off or i might actually go because i'm gonna go i need to get a haircut today because you know junction two tomorrow and my hair is looking absolutely so i'm gonna go get a haircut today and then might go to the gym later on and do some deadlifts um, after I finish work. But yeah, um, looking a bit, looking a bit weird, isn't it? Looking a bit weird hair wise. But yeah, allergies are an absolute b i t c h man. Um, God bless all of us out there who are suffering from them. And because of such thing, I have here some lemon, some uh, green tea with a bit of honey in it. So if you're out there and you're also suffering from allergies, cheers. Let's have a little, a uh, little sip of the tea. Oh God, I'm at you, man. God, man. That feels good. Anyway, it's episode 205, 205. Hope you guys are doing well out there. I'm doing amazing, feeling good. Like I said before, I'm going to Junction 2 tomorrow. So um, no DJing for me this Friday. And also no DJing again next Friday because I'm going to be in Paris for a weekend trip. So that should be fun. So uh, DJing is on the ho- on hold for this weekend. I might have a little cheeky gig on Saturday that might come through. So let's see what happens there. But apart from that, looking forward to go and see other people play on a main stage in the middle of Boston. Man, like I mentioned previously, I'm really nervous about Junction 2. I'm really nervous. Number one, I've found out through email that we're not allowed to take sealed water bottles, which is a really big bummer for me. Uh, I wanted to take sealed water bottles with me for obvious reasons. But, you know, unfortunately, that cannot happen. So you're going to have to uh, do any kind of pre-drinking uh well, yeah, any pre-drink is going to have to be done you know, prior to going into the festival, which is a bit of a bummer because both, both my friend and I have tickets that only allow us entry before 2 p.m. So we're going to be chugging on um, alcoholic uh, beverages at 12 in the afternoon or something, which is a bit crazy. But, you know, it's festival time. So, you know, your body clock goes off, uh, off the reservoir for the most part. And then, yeah, then the sound, didn't it? So I'm worried about the sound, but the sound, 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 sound. I'm really worried about the sound. Hopefully, um, it's loud enough. It should be. It's underneath a motorway in the middle of a park, away from residential area. So, they should be able to be a little bit more lenient with the sound. But I'm not sure how it is with the traffic. I'm not sure how much you could hear if you were in a car. Anyway, driving over that bridge and you hear, I don't know, maybe you would because, again, it will seep through the, the, the concrete. I'm not too sure. But hopefully, the sound is good. I'm assuming the organization will be pretty decent. So, I'm not worried about that. But I'm just worried about the sound overall and how that goes on. But let's see what happens with there oh actually i think i've got some uh post here one second bear with me
Oh yeah, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Had to get a little envelope there, little parcel package. Doing this live. Doing this live as a. a what, who's that guy? Who said that? Um, where is he? Disappeared in it off the TV. Let's fuck it. Let's do it live. Who's that guy again? It doesn't matter. So Junction Two. Worried about the sound. I'm worried about the organization. But I feel the organization should be good for the most part. Most festivals, most London festivals, are okay with organization in terms of like getting people in and out, getting people through the little security check-ins, uh, checking your ticket, lockers, toilets. We use usually quite decent with that sort of stuff the only problem is usually the sound um if you've been anywhere especially even not your carnival is a good example right they usually are a bit um they usually are a bit lax with the sound there they usually try to like they usually take as many liberties as they can because you know they shut off the sound systems i think at 10 right p.m or something like that so everything gets closed off really quick um at you no know, 10 on the dot or whatever time it is it shuts so they can be a bit more lenient that way a festival probably not so much and you know it's not moving around i don't know i don't know i'm hoping it should be quite loud this it's the middle of a park under a motorway it should be quite decent isn't it there's no real reason why it shouldn't be too loud or it sh there's no reason why it sh wouldn't be loud enough um that's my thinking hopefully anyway fingers crossed but yeah gonna get a haircut gonna buy some socks to wear with my boots, I'm probably going to end up wearing my Rico in trousers, my Rico in shorts and my cassette player tee, some Docs Martin boots so I don't get them fucked up. I was going to take my trainers, but you know, I don't want to get my trainers fucked up because I'm assuming it will be in a park. The, the the grass will be quite dry. People will be dancing and moving around in it. So it end up, you know, uh, all these dust particles end up floating all over the place. So your shoes will end up be covered in soot and brown nonsense. So I'm just going to take my Dr. Martens with me and wear those and be comfortable in some pair of shorts and a jacket, really. And that's about it. And probably carry all my stuff in my little uh, places and faces, side bag, thingy, my jiggy that I've got here that I take with me literally everywhere. It's a bit battered and bruised and stuff. But yeah, I think that might be the best way to go about things. Um, but yeah, so that's basically the goal. So Friday, Junction 2, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm only going on Friday, not going to go on Saturday. Like I said, I'm going to keep that Saturday open just in case I need to DJ somewhere. Um, it's unlikely because I haven't got an email so far, but sometimes you, you, know, you get those last minute gigs uh, that kind of pop into your inbox that you want to kind of do. And yeah, it'll be good. Um, it'll be good to take a break too this weekend, to be honest. I've been DJing consecutively, I don't know, ever since the beginning of the year. So that should be a good time to do those things. Um, what else is going on with me? That's about it really, isn't it? Oh, there's um, uh, England playing Holland today, right? For the your nations what's that the nations league whatever that nonsense is does anyone know what that competition is no does anyone care not really it's just like a a more serious friendly really is it friendly really i don't know man would you be annoyed if you're a football player and you had to like cut your summer holiday short to go play this national nations league thing it's a bit pointless isn't it really um but yeah um apart from being pointless we saw what you know what uh star players can do for you right Cristiano ronaldo wow i think it goes to show that as naturally gifted as Messi is and as a, as alien-like as he is in terms of stuff that he can do on the pitch, I think as a leader and as a real driving force, there's no there's no one better than Cristiano Ronaldo, really. And I don't think... I think someone mentioned it the other day. If Cristiano Ronaldo was playing for Barcelona, there's no way they would have lost 4-0, right? He would have done... He would have done something to inflict some kind of damage, uh, to have got the team to defend, to get them to change tactics, to push them forward, to have scored a goal on a counter-attack and really quieten the crowd. He would have done something. And that performance yesterday against Switzerland, don't get me wrong, it's not, you know, it's no Brazil, it's no Italy, it's no France. You know what I mean? It's no Croatia. It's not the strongest team in the world, but for him to score three, three goals or a hat trick, right? He scored that amazing free kick, then the Switzerland level off the back of a controversial VAR penalty, and then he ends up scoring two goals in what five minutes or something to kind of kill the game. Two excellent finishes, like just I don't know, freak of nature, man. And he's thirty-four, and he looks better than ever. He's still got pace. He's still got that bit of acceleration to get past the defender. He may, he might not have the pace that can take him from one end of the pitch to the other end of the pitch, but he's still got that pace to get past the defender, right? Do a trick, burst past him. He's incredibly clinical. He doesn't waste time with his tricks. Everything's for like a everything's for an end product. When he does a trick, is to cross the ball in. When he does a trick, is to get a shot on goal. When he does a trick, is to make space. Like it's never just for the sake of it. He's absolutely disgusting, man. Um, really, really good. And then the other side of it, I heard Joao Felix had a bit of a poor game. But again, it's, it's too expected. And the young players always have a bit of dips in performance and stuff. But once he gets some experience, and consistency will come off the back of that. But he's still a talent in that respect. He reminds me so much of Rui Costa, isn't it, Joao Felix? Even the way he moves and stuff, like really, really similar with, with Rui Costa. It's funny how they tend to always kind of... Uh, it's similar to like... Do you remember on Pro Lucian Soccer where a player would retire... <laughs> Because they got older and you're playing the the you know the season side. I don't know what that was called on Pro Evo. You had the bit where you could um, be with a team and just keep playing from season in season out. 
So a player retire and then they'll get like respawned in another version of somebody else, right? With slightly different features, slightly different way, but but generally the kind of the same sort of player, right? The long gangly striker that's got pace and a good shot, the small kind of off the shoulder fast um, winger, like really really cool players who kind of get respawned, and you kind of see a lot of that happening in real life too. These players kind of come out like Leroy Sane kind of reminds me so much more of Ryan Giggs than anyone else right? out there. Um, they kind of get respawned in different kind of iterations. So yeah, um, great to see. But again, you know, England playing later on today. I might go watch it later, but you know, maybe not. Maybe who who knows who see. So let's get into some topics because that's what we're here for. Some topics I've seen on the internet. So what we do on this show, we browse the internet, we clip some shows, or I could not we I clip some shows, put them in my notes, and then we speak about them because that is what is meant to be to speak. So number one, in startup news, Uber Eats merges with the Uber app, which I, I didn't see coming really. Um, I'm surprised they're doing. I'm not sure what the reason is behind it. Um, I'm not sure if other people were calling for it, but I didn't see this coming. I'm not sure if other people did and you're much smarter than I am in that regard. Hold on, let me just take that off too. But yeah, I didn't see this one coming, man. I didn't think it was such a big deal in that respect, but I guess, again, maybe that's why these guys earned the big bucks and here we are talking about things on the interwebs um so yeah so this is article from TechCrunch. it says uber eats um uber eats uber eats embedding it into the main app uh, i like that play on words it said there right so it, it, following let's read this article here it's from TechCrunch. um uber's best hope to be all ride sharing and food delivery competitors is that it does both um through one cross promotion it can continue activities it can combine activities uh, people might only do a few times per week or month into one product they open daily. Uber CEO Dara something said crypt- crypt- cryptically on the company's first earnings call last month that suffice it to say we are starting to experiment in ways in which we can upsell our ride customers to Uber Eats deals in, in a way that, you know, to be plain spoken isn't annoying. I will tell you that we are very, very, very early stages of exploring the many ways in which we, our rider business can help continue to build our Uber Eats business and vice versa. I wonder what do I mean by that? Does that mean you can order the, um, from deliveries from restaurants further away than what you are if someone has a car that you don't mind waiting for a little bit longer? I wonder what that is. I don't want to give away too much. Okay, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So, um, but TechCrunch has discovered that specifically Uber is starting to make a web view of Uber Eats accessible from its main app. A tipster in Boston first clued us into the feature. Now, and now Uber confirms that it's merging a fully functional web version of Uber Eats into its ride hailing product. Uber quietly began rolling out a pilot of the merged app in a late April. That's interesting because I've used, um, I'm not sure about you guys, when I'm, when I'm at home and I want to order an Uber Eats, I tend to use my laptop. If I'm using my laptop, I don't tend to use my phone unless I'm out. So, um, yeah, I'll just use my laptop to ride the Ubis and it kind of tracks it, same sort of way. You kind of get all the big pictures, you get all the big pictures on there. Um, the only thing I'm not a fan of is maybe the descriptions of the dishes are not quite clear sometimes. It's just broken down in terms of ingredients, not about, I don't know, how it's cooked and stuff. Maybe a bit more descriptive. Maybe they could introduce some, like, um, GIFs of how it looks on the plate and it getting prepped, maybe some video of it or something like that, of it being put together. Imagine like a burger being put together with the sauce and stuff, lettuce, condiments, all that sort of malarkey, the meat, and put them I mean, might make it a bit more tantalizing. I don't know. That's interesting. Um, Uber, Uber Eats app will remain available as a standalone app. Uh, the move could give Uber customers acquisition and retention edge on single product competitors like Lyft and DoorDash while helping to keep up with product um, multi-product peers like Khmer and Bolt, which recently added food delivery. And its biggest global foe, Didi from China. Okay, cool. This is all globally. I think in Europe or in the UK for the most part, they've got no real competition. DoorDash, Just Eat, even Deliveroo are kind of way, way, way behind um, Uber Eats in that regard. Like you, you definitely see more Uber Eats uh, couriers and drivers around than you would do a Deliveroo person even. Um, but but, but Didi in, in, in China, which has launched for delivery in Uber stronghold Mexico. Okay, cool. That makes sense because when I was in Mexico City, that we use Uber completely. Um, combining functionality means Uber's uh, ride-hailing customers could see a promotion for Uber Eats and instantly try it without downloading a new app as their um, as their tummy rumbles. It could also get fifty percent of Uber Eats customers to ride. Don't ride. Uber. Okay, really? So there's a lot of people that use Uber Eats and don't use Uber. I didn't know that. Interesting. Okay, uh, we're rolling out a very new way to order eats directly in the Uber app on Android. 
Um, and Uber spokesman tells me the cross promotion gives riders who are new to Eats a seamless way to order a meal via a web view instead of opening up an app on the download. The merged app is now available on all iOS users in all cities where Uber doesn't offer bikes and scooters that already cluster the interface of its car app service such as SF, um, LA and New York City. The Android version is out is out to the 17% of users in, the, uh, in Uber Eats and 500 markets uh, uh, with the goal of cross-promotion tool being available to all riders. And the spokesperson says, we believe our platform model allows us to acquire, engage and retain customers with the cost as well as um, uh, efficiency and effectiveness advantage of our rivals. Typically, uh, Manoline uh, competitors, we have found that we, we what we found is that with uh, rides and eats we are seeing early signal where essentially you can have very little if any cannibalization of a ride and throw a significant amount of potential demand into the eat side okay i never knew this was a thing i never knew that people were just using uber eats um i mean uber eats app as a standalone app instead of actually using uber because that's how i discovered uber eats right i wouldn't discover it without using uber um they've kind of both are things i use quite often uber of course you know you're running home late especially after my dj gigs you don't want to get a bus you want to walk to a fucking train station you just get an uber and just jump home especially the times that i finish aren't usually the peak times around what after one or up before 11 so or after one or just before 12 so you can kind of really get a cheap ride there and yeah i mean just see how that goes on globally how that deals with it but yeah they're trying to merging it out at the moment you should see where that's where this develops uber eats merging with uber interesting to see next on the list here what do we have ba, 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 ba. we have jay-z is the first hip-hop billionaire awesome great to know um congratulations to him i think it was a it was obvious this was going to happen i think if you were paying attention to what was going on in music paying attention to the kind of moves he was doing i think a very wise man once said you know don't listen to what i say uh watch what i do so jay's always been kind of, jay's always been the master of um uh um, diversifying his income source or income or stream of income and consider i think someone made a good point of it the other day i think joe Biden made a good point of it which is really something that should be of concern to some artists who are in it to make money or some artists who are in it to become tycoons or build empires if you're just in it to make music then i guess you shouldn't worry but even then you maybe should try and diversify your income stream just because you know uh, music is so it's so um music fans are a little bit what you call it they're not disloyal but you know they're a little bit um fair weather right if a new person comes along who offers them what they want they'll just dump you in an instant really so you can't really rely on that too often and i think joe Biden made a good point of it in his podcast where he says the concerning thing that all artists should be looking at this breakdown of jay-z's mil- of billions is the fact that music makes up so little of his portion of overall wealth even though he's one of the only artists or especially the top tier artists within his space who owns their masters right who's able to uh call the shots on when his music releases and puts it out when he wants to have his own streaming platform right he's the pinnacle of ownership he's a pinnacle of determining your own destiny and so much of his catalog and so little of his catalog makes up of his overall wealth considering that he's been doing music longer than he's been doing business that's quite scary right thinking about it like he's he's been a musician he's been a rapper he's been an elite rapper for longer than he's been a businessman but a business is far outstrip his rapping which is really scary and shows just how much just how important it is to have endorsements sponsorships stakes in companies um uh projects you're working on even without your name being attached to it um what's that what's that thing called franchises right owning a burger king or a wendy's all these kind of things that other people do or wingstop like rick ross it's really really important because i think this this article from forbes breaks down the entirety of his, of his um income or so far his wealth i'm assuming he was always he's always been a, he's been a billionaire maybe for the best part of a couple of years now um that would make sense um but i guess maybe now because you know he's having to file certain things with taxes um they're able to kind of estimate his wealth from the, whatever public knowledge they have and they've kind of come to the assumption that he now is worth um one billion or he has a one billion dollar empire out there which is fucking insane imagine how cre- imagine how creative you'll be right imagine how because i think it's strange though because sometimes some types of creativity are born from the fact that you have no food on your plate right you need to get a roof over your head you're struggling to keep warm 
you just in real dire straits all your peers have just left you behind you feel fucking you like an absolute loser but some of the some of the best creativity comes from the point of not suffering right of not worrying about where your next meal is going to come from so it's part of me that thinks some of his best work will come now and when the Stoza Prize 444 was so amazing and so introspective was that he was he was in a place where you know he didn't need that to sell well right he doesn't he doesn't he's not counting on first week sales he's not relying on numbers on the billboard he's just putting out music that he feels really much connected to and music that he thinks is going to make a difference right he's kind of trying to leave his mark on the cultural timeline of of what we're doing right now and i think that must really help being that financially secure you're able to just go into a booth and just be free experiment try new things try different sounds collaborate who you want to collaborate with without your name being besmirched in some way shape or form best read the article it's from forbes Artist icon billionaire, how Jay Z created his one billion dollar fortune. Um, let's see here. We can read the top. Let's open a paragraph. Nine years ago, two unlikely lunch partners sat down in Hollywood din- Diner in Omaha, Nebraska. One Warren Buffett and a regular there, and the other was Jay Z. Was not the billionaire and rapper ordered strawberry malts and chatted amiably, continuing the conversation back at Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway offices. Buffett then eighty walked away, impressed with the artist, forty years his junior. Jay's Jay is teaching in a lot bigger classroom than I'll ever teach. For a young person growing up, he's the guy to learn from 100%. From his raps, what he says, his lyrics, to just how he moves and what things that he's doing, it's always good to keep an eye on what those people are doing and just kind of replicate it. Because I think, again, that's the best thing. Sometimes people are always waiting for, you know, some people that call in to call in, especially the Gary V call-ins and stuff annoys me. They're always asking for like, you know, uh, direct help and suggestions. Just like, just look at what Gary V's doing, right? He's like a... He's a he's a he's like a, a stone cold businessman, an entrepreneur who's running you know a two hundred million dollar company. Uh, he's trying to buy the jets, and he's you know spending an exor- an inordinate amount of time developing his Gary V persona online, posting stuff on Instagram, podcasting, doing calling shows. Just watch what he's doing and recreate it. If he's going that hard in the paint on his social, just do the same thing with yours. If you're trying to be um, somebody of influence, if you're trying to be a, a thought leader or a spokesperson for a different kind of scene, you don't need an answer. Same with a rapper thing, right? If you want to be as big as Jay-Z and own your masters and create the empire he's created, just do what he's doing. Don't ask him any questions. Just follow what he Just follow his lead in whatever way that you can do it, right? Anyway, it continues. Um, less than a decade later, it's clear that Jay-Z's accumulated a fortune that uh, conservatively totals $1 billion, making him one of only a handful of entertainers who become a billionaire and the first hip-hop artist to do so. Jay-Z steadily growing kingdom of his expensive, encompassing liquor, art, real estate, and stakes in companies like Uber, which is interesting. That Uber story is fucking incredible, right? Supposedly that Uber story goes something along the lines of uh, Beyonce was meant to perform at one of Uber's um, parties, Christmas party, or wherever it may be, when Travis Clackanic was still in charge, when they were when they were like in their full-on startup phase, right? But he got booted out, unfortunately, now. Um, so he was, she was meant to perform there and instead of taking uh, the fee that she demands usually she decided to up for a stake in the company and like a, a minor percentage and I think they gave it to her she performed she left and then when Uber filed for an IPO just recently um, that fortune rose you know ex- you know exponentially to like I don't know hundreds of millions of dollars which is again uh, an incredible an incredible turn of events for both of them um, as a couple I assume because again joint fortunes are better than uh, solo fortunes um, his journey is all the more impressive given his start. The Brooklyn Notorious Marcy housing project. He was a drug dealer before becoming a musician. Starting his label Rockefeller Records to release his 1996 debut, Reasonable Doubt. Since then, he has amassed 14 number, number one albums, 22 Grammys, and over 500 million in pre tax earnings in a decade. Again, the, the impressive thing about Jay Z isn't just that. I say that's super impressive, really impressive, extraordinary. The most impressive thing about people of that kind of considerable level of wealth. Which I think is, uh, adv- is I think something you'd see in a lot of startups too. When um, PayPal exited, when WordPress exited, it, 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 what else did you have one? There's a few others. MySpace, when that sold and the guy kind of like, you know, he's completely cut off from social, doesn't really do many interviews, just lives his life quietly, doing his philanthropic pro- uh, projects. The most impressive thing, impressive thing about Jay-Z is the fact is how many other people around him have become millionaires off the back of the work that he's done. He's empowered so many different people. And I think that's the key to his success, his ability to build empires. I think in general, I think I used to be extremely naive because I'm quite um because I'm quite headstrong and I do things on my own and I don't really like help and I don't ask for help. I was I, I was incredibly naive in terms of how much I could do on my own, right? Thinking I could do everything on my own, I could build my own empire, build my own tycoon, I don't need any help. 
But what you realize the older you the older you get is that you need a network. Again, I'll go back to that kind of article that I mentioned from Artnet that said, you know, a precursor, a predictor of who's gonna be a very successful contemporary artist is the network that they keep, right? In terms of the gallery represent people in their peer group, the people that they socialize with, you know, just just picture those famous pictures of people in Studio fifty four. What made those pictures really incredible is the kind of juxtaposition of the celebrities that you'd see in there, the individuals, right? Cultural figures, politi- politicians, artists, designers, architects. That network is what kind of really dictates how far you go in, right? Because you could be in a club and you could bump into somebody who desires you and you're an architect and they want you to stage design their next tour. You've never done it before, but they, they really trust your vision. All of a sudden, you then become a stage designer. That all then goes into you maybe making music, whatever. It kind of cascades into there. But I think, the older you become, the more you realize that your network or your your people that you keep around you, your friends, are the ones that are really going to determine how far you go. And sometimes being able to empower your friends and show them that if they stick by you, that you know there's only you know um, milk and honey at the end of that rainbow, it's a really really difficult skill to do because you only have to see the amount of crews have, that have crumbled or that have disbanded due to differences in creative vision and maybe deals and all that sort of stuff. It's really hard to kind of find that balance of like how do I empower my friends to stick with me right and to help me grow and how do i also help them grow themselves in their lane right because essentially you know he's probably got in his social group maybe five plus people that are are caught are on paper millionaires which is flip insane considering he's the star usually in hip-hop or rap groups or in that kind of creative even just a creative field there's a one person you kind of all band around and kind of make sure you push and you facilitate their journey but the people around are just you know hanging on for crumbs you're just on salary right but he's able to really i think kevin house is the same thing too with the red cup boys right he's given them instead of just putting them on salary he's allowed them you know, a platform to do their own thing right to contribute um in terms of ideas for maybe his jokes or to build out their own tv series or to do shows on his comedy on his laugh out loud comedy network and stuff that's the way to kind of really build an empire to real really build wealth um going forward and i think again it's a real it's a real talent that a lot of people don't really take take too much notice to but i've noticed in the biggest people usually you know look look at their closest friends like they're all rich too you know what I mean? Or they're all well off as well. Um, the moment you start noticing the crew's looking a bit straggly and there's only one person looking shiny and it's got exfoliated skin and wearing nice clothes and looks like they had a good night's sleep, that's probably not a good sign. <laughs> it should probably be the other way around, isn't it? It should probably be the person that's the leader should be the one looking more disheveled than actually the the, the ones around him. Anyway, um, so what's Jay-Z worth? Uh, to calculate his net worth, we looked at the artist's stakes in companies, um, Da, 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 then added up his income, subtracting the healthy amount of for to account for superstar lifestyle. So, um, um, uh, our man De Brignac, that's um, Ace of Spades, right? Um, and uh, Jay Z had used his music to shield the three hundred dollar bottles of Ace of Spades uh, champagne since launching the brand. Oh, that's his actual brand. I had no idea. Mamma mia. Okay, it's underneath the Our Man De Brignac, whatever. Three hundred, three hundred ten million. Um. Show me what you got. More recently, his verse on Meek Mill's What's Free put his half billion dollar value on the wine, which seems like a bit too bubbly for a number. Um, cash and in investments, 220 million. A vast investment portfolio includes a stake in Uber worth an estimated 70 million. He reportedly purchased his piece for 2 million back in 2000. Oh, this is outside of Beyonce. Wow. And then w- Wide found uh, another 5 million in an attempt to increase his holdings, but was rebuffed. Mama mia. Do say he has 100 million in Do say. Jay Z's Cognac. Cognac, a joint venture with beverage giant Bacardi, moves almost 200,000 cases and has almost grown nearly to 80, 80% annually. Jay-Z resonates with consumers who are attracted to the ultra premium lifestyle. Yeah, again, Duce Palooza has probably done a good job of helping that too. Tidal, 100 million. Mamma Mia. Rock Nation, 75. This wide-ranging entertainment company started over a decade ago and a joint venture with concert uh, giant Live Nation. Rock Nation represents some of the biggest stars. Yeah, they do um, in terms of uh, doing people's tours, right? That's amazing. Entertainment through sports agency. They can represent Kevin Durant and Todd Gurdley as well as record label arts management arms um, representing Rihanna and J. Cole. Music catalog, 75 million. Again, a small fraction of what his overall thing is. See, his music, like, look at look at it. On the, if you see on the screen, his music uh, catalog is worth 75 million, according to Forbes, and his art collection is worth 70. He's been doing music, like, for, what, 20 years, maybe plus, um, at a high level, owning most of his masters, if not all of his masters, and publishing. But he's only, it, like, and his art, which is probably only started buying as of late, in 2013, is it? 2013, purchased his first piece of art. Mamma mia, man. Music is deadly. Um... 
he's got yeah Picasso's and then he's real estate 50 million he owns homes all over the place I'm assuming right after welcoming twin 2017 Jay-Z and Beyonce bought a pair of homes to match 26 million East Hampton mansion and 88 million Bel Air estate Jay-Z also owns a Tribeca Capent house snagged at 6.5 million in 2004 wow amazing man super inspiring to see I think for all people for everyone involved in the culture maybe the culture even just music in whatever hip hop just in whatever in just life right just to see this is what happens when you diversify your income yeah more money begets more money man amazing amazing success and again an, a marker of just how well he's done things paved his own way he hasn't really played industry games and yeah he's reaped the benefits of it man he's reaped the benefits of it tenfold next on the list here we have dark net dark net sales are up something um that i'm sure a few of us are very aware of here it's an article from the bbc let me get up here on the screen for you guys to check out ba, 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 ba. where is it there you go so darknet uh, drug sales on the rise in england um again no surprise there considering um the rise in festival attendance and stuff like that it does, doesn't surprise me at all um it says here the following and um, the number of people in england buying drugs on the dark net has more than doubled since 2014 the global drug survey has found the annual survey question of over 120,000 people from more than 30 countries um its data showed that the number of drug users in england buying products on the dark net has risen 12 percent to nearly 28 percent england also had the third highest number of illegal drugs delivered to order behind scotland and brazil okay cool brazil's drug um delivery thing is big it's interesting why that would be big right because uh, you see videos of people um openly selling cocaine and shit on the street right on the boardwalk of the beach and shit to tourists whatever um um you go to people say you go to favelas and you go buy gear do you know what i mean for like 20 30 dollars a piece so i'm surprised that brazil's but i guess maybe if you're a rich person because it's quite segregated brazil right the rich people tend to live in their own little place with guarded by private security so i guess those kind of people wouldn't want to risk going down to a favela to go pick up <laughs> a joint or something right because you end up getting stripped of all your possessions so that might make sense but i'm surprised that one um and there were no specific figures about Wales or North Ireland, which I'm pretty sure is still going to have it. Because you know I mean, those places where kids are generally a bit bored, don't have much to do, they all long to come to London or to Manchester or to Liverpool, will probably end up doing some recreational drugs of choice or something. I'd imagine, right? Um, usually those kind of areas alcohol abuse is really high too but i don't know um the study founder adam winstock says people do not understand the risk involved in buying drugs online if you're given your name somebody knows you bought little drugs online and then there's possibly that will they will blackmail you yeah that's true but i think the issue again this talking hypothetically for people that i know who have bought drugs online the problem isn't the fact that you're scared of your safety the your kind your kind of uh bargaining that you'd rather give away your personal address or an address of your workplace or address of a friend or a post office box or something so that you can confirm you can guarantee that your item you're getting is the item that you want right so if it's a real thing it's not something that's been cut or boshed or made in a warehouse somewhere it's the real product because um, the benefit of a marketplace similar to now Amazon is that most of the items sold on there are heavily reliant on user reviews, right? They kind of they kind of model their um, um, websites basically like Amazon, right? So there's a lot of reviewing on there. Um, the sellers really uh, take a real keen interest on making sure people leave reviews on their items too. Um, users leave reviews on things that they buy to let other people know if the service was good or it wasn't good when it comes down to stealth when it comes down to overall delivery time product quality everything gets rated so it's within the seller's best interest to sell good things because again you can scam if you want to you could come in and sell some because there's been people i've heard who've done a similar sort of thing who have come in and sold something good for two weeks or for a month and then suddenly started to sell bosch after that right because you can there's a window you could probably get away with doing that for about two months or a month or two months and a half but after a while the reviews will start catching up with you and people just suddenly um um back off and won't want to spend their money with you because they'd rather go somewhere else they can trust so a lot of the rampant drug use online has to do with the fact that th there isn't a reliable way to get it on the street right for the most part which is how it should be because it's, a, it's an illegal substance it's a class a substance if you get caught selling it or buying it you could get in big trouble when you go to prison right so that makes sense but the way that it comes into england if you look at if you read books like zero 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 by roberto saviano which i might have somewhere around here do i have it here to show you uh, no but i recommend you check it out it's a book called zero 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 by roberto saviano 
he's written quite a, he's written another book called Gomorrah 2 which is based on which is kind of set which the TV series is based on around kind of the Sicilian mafia um, but essentially if you look at if you read those kind of books and you find out about how the drug trade kind of flows into Europe what you'll find out is that most of the stuff especially if you're taking consideration of cocaine comes from Central to South America it then comes through Africa um, it then comes um, through what was well, Central Africa um, oh sorry East Africa yeah yeah no West Africa Central Africa up to North Africa Morocco places and then it heads it, and then from there it heads into Europe right and the main port is usually in Italy or some places in, in Central Europe. And then from there, it kind of gets split out and, you know, thrown into other parts of Europe, whether it be, you know, England, uh, Italy, France, Spain, or the other side, right? Um, and usually what ends up happening when it comes into the main ports of Europe, it starts to get cut from there. It doesn't get touched when it comes from Central America to Africa to Europe. It gets cut and it gets boshed down from Europe because there's not much of it that can get through. Because for it to get from Central America to Africa is pretty easy. There's there's not as much security as there would be from Africa to Europe. They're always looking for things. And port- there's, I think there's a beach recently, I think it off Morocco, where they washed up you know massive bricks and keys of cocaine that people found up um, that from a sh- from a ship that sank. Loads of that stuff happens all the time. So they tend to kind of get they t- tend to get away with it from Central America to Africa. So what ends up happening by the time they get kids to Europe, it gets boshed, and by the time you get your product from some scabby kid in the pub somewhere in East London, you know it's been mixed with what however many other supplements, um, you know other things in there to kind of fluff it up or to make the, it more have more bang for their buck. By the time you get it, it's absolutely boshed to shit. It's poor quality. Your health is in question. All that sort of stuff. So if if you're talking about pure money value for money i'd assume you'd want the real item right um in terms of uh ease of use as well in terms of a uh, quality of service it might make sense to buy it online again it's very dangerous it's a illegal thing to do i wouldn't advise anyone to do it if you get caught you can get in big trouble but i understand the premise behind it and, I'm, and again thinking about the spike that comes from the festival attendances and people going to club nights and stuff no people not going to club nights people going to festivals instead of going to club nights it makes complete sense that this now is coming going up um but the article continues here a little bit briefly on um, the Darknet is a network of untraceable online activity and, and hidden websites. In addition to the illegality and investigation by BBC podcast, the next episode found hundreds of people claiming to have been scammed or blackmailed by vendors. It happens all the time. It happens even in real life. Um, Leon says, I got a very angry message saying I got your address and threatening to either release it or show up there. It says something nasty. This was someone who was a crack and heroin dealer. Um, obviously, I, I don't have any consumer protection legally. Uh, duh, obviously. This kid, man, Leon, what a fucking fig. <laughs> uh, Caleb Daniels is a crypto market expert, and he said, what we're seeing is a perfect storm. More users are going to online whilst untested sites are popping up. Um, this leaves users vulnerable, of course, but most of the time, if you're if you're smart, like most sites, again, have you ever seen an online store that you don't recognize? You just type into Google and review, and automatically you see loads of people reviewing and say, oh, I don't buy from this place, they don't ship on time, they're poor. You, everyone does it. I, I don't I've, I don't remember a time where I've willingly given my credit card details or number to anybody, let alone a darknet site, which which you should be taking even more precaution with, because by the most, for, on most accounts, you could just set up a darknet store within a post for half an hour. If you read, um, if you read, uh, um, What's the one called? Ah, oh, what's the book that I've got from Silk Road? There's a book on Silk Road founder who's now in prison for like, you know, 30 years or plus, whatever. That kind of, stip- you know, he kind of breaks down how quickly it got him to kind of set up the market. It's not hard to do. Maintaining is difficult. Being untraceable is difficult. Keeping your anonymity is difficult. But to set up a marketplace is not so hard to do. So if you to hand over your details willingly, you're probably, you know, you probably deserve to get scammed if you're doing it. At least do your research. Um, National Crime Agency spokesman said tracking, uh, tackling the cyber crime threat is a priority. We have lots of operational success and have led a number of investigations into criminal activity on the dark web, which has resulted in individuals being convicted. But yeah, this is just police speaking. It they would say that, wouldn't they? Um, Darknet expert Chris Montero said drug dealing on the darknet is not a priority for the police. The police are limited to what they can do. It will keep dealing with issues. Of course, it's not a priority. There's bigger things they should be worrying about than people uh, scoring some uh, class A drugs on there. For the most part, again, it should. there's other things on there, such as child pornography, such as people selling weapons and all that kind of illegal stuff. And maybe people, um, what do you call it, cracking into banking institutes and all that sort of malarkey. Those are the things they should be worrying about more. I think the use of class A drugs online... Sh- should be it's unregulated as it is anyway because it's hard to manage but it should be left up to the adult to kind of choose they want to do that if you do do it that you know the risk involved but then if you do know the risk involved don't be surprised that if you're going to get scammed in it like that leon kid talking about how he's i don't have much security protection of course you don't you're buying stuff off darknet what do you expect to happen my friend 
Um, people are strange, isn't it? Anyway, let's continue. Uh, festival fiasco. Oh my god, festival fiasco. I'm nervous now because Junction 2 is coming up tomorrow and I don't want this festival to go bad. I'm hoping it won't go bad. Da, 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 da. What's the worst five guys texting me for? Okay, so um, this is an article from Mixmag, right? Mixmag got this cool little article out. They put it, they put some good features out, you know, the writers. They just they do a good job. Not as good as maybe not as well crafted as maybe a resident advisor, maybe, but they do a good job of consistently putting out quite cool features. I like the stuff they're doing, man. So whoever's out there writing or commissioning some of these pieces, congratulations and bravo to you. You're doing a, an amazing job. So this is a, 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 a title of uh, an article title festival fiasco poorly organized events are putting you at risk um, ultimately very very true right and this is kind of coming off the back of um ja rule going oh do you see you seen that video actually this before we read that you seen flipping ja rule going on the breakfast club talking about how he wants to redo uh the fire festival again bloody hell some there's no some people have no hubris in it no sense of awareness no self-reflection um no humility right he somehow thinks he can it's like what makes what gives him any right to think that he can do a festival better than some of the festivals that are out there now, especially after that kind of fiasco that happened. And again, it's really bizarre too how watching that documentary again. Documentaries are quite they're not the truth, right? They're not the whole truth or nothing but the truth. They paint a particular narrative. We've seen it happen with the Michael Jackson thing, but I'm just surprised. Not calling for anyone to be arrested or anything, but isn't it surprising how he didn't get in any trouble at all? Like he didn't get slapped on the wrist, he didn't get convicted, not fined, he didn't spend a couple of days in prison, nothing. He just got away with it scot free. Like, everything was Billy McFarlane's fault. It's, I, I don't know if that's true. Watching that video, he was complicit in something, right? Or or, gleef, or willfully ignorant or some other things. But anyway, um, Ja Rule and Irv Gotti were on Breakfast Club, minus Charlemagne the God, which, you know, again, was disappointing because I think that would have made it a more interesting conversation. But he said something along the lines of this, right? This is uh, Ja Rule. What, is, what, is, what did he say? He said this. Let's, let's, let's put this on here. This guy, man. Mamma mia. Literally. Which, when they need to say, yo, motherfucker, it wasn't me. Right. You know what I'm saying? And here's my side of the story. And I... Okay, so here's him talking. Let's see. And it's just giving the artist a voice when they need to say, yo, motherfucker, it wasn't me. Right. You know what I'm saying? And here's my side of the story. And I don't need to get propped up in front of a microphone or, or sit down with Gail King or any some other funny shit to say, yo, this is my story, and that's what it is. You know what I'm saying? And I don't need to say much more about it. And that's what I did. I just said, you know what? I'm gonna just take the Twitter. I'm gonna go out and say my what I, you know, what I'm saying what I need to say, and that's that. I said what I said, and that's it. I'm not gonna sit back and talk to talk about it over and over and over and over, and over again. But now here's the thing that I want to bring to light, and I'm like, <laughs> the crazy shit is when you look at what happened with my festival and everything, right? Here's what I said. Okay, when I look at the big picture, right? Big picture is rich, rich, rich mm -hmm. white kids with the food my festival mm -hmm. enjoy didn't get the tents that they paid for in the front. Correct. Okay. It's an issue, but it's not like. Come on, man. This guy's underselling the problem, right? It wasn't just like, really? Is that is that all you're saying? Just the tents or the problem? What happened to the stage? What happened to the musicians? What happened to the toiletries? What happened to the infrastructure? What happened to the lady that had to, the, the, the catering? Like, this guy, man, mama. This reminds me of a lot of startup founders I've worked with. One who I won't name by name, who knows exactly who he is. This is just like, sometimes it's like, there is a certain, maybe it's a psychopath um, um, trait in some people. This kind of, because sometimes it can work to your benefit, right? This kind of level of just blindly, um, believing in your ability to execute something that you've obviously shown you can't do is somehow a, a precursor to the big dictating how successful you will be in some respects right that kind of idea that you no know, that steve jobs i that steve jobs rumor or story where he told them to design something about the iphone in under two weeks something like that and they said it should it should take six months They're like no i need it in two weeks right that aspect of like throwing out impossible deadlines and then pushing your team to the brink and then they do it and then you're like looking at it as like you know you're the great leader i don't know but this is weird like it, bro. it's not you know money can be replaced you know what i'm saying these things can can, can be you know replaced now i'm gonna fast forward to rolling loud just last week mm -hmm. or two weeks ago six people got married mm -hmm. <laughs> Lil Wayne said I'm not fucking performing because of police presence at the venue Kodak Black got arrested at the venue 
You know what I'm saying? NBA young boy's car got shot up. His girl got shot. <laughs> Why we ain't hearing nothing about the when, when these documentaries coming out? You know what I'm saying? This, when, now I'm not making black. <laughs> He's saying so much shit. Just to continue. Let's finish it anyway. I think it feels like when it's black people being fucking ostracized and fucked over, it don't mean nothing. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Right. But white kids that didn't get their tents that they fucking were promised and went on and party. You know what I'm saying? And went on, you know what I'm saying? And went on a party in Miami or went on a party in the Bahamas. They made two documentaries about this and I tried know. to make me fucking the black eye of festivals. You know what? And though? my festival wasn't in the West Coast. Niggas was getting raped at fucking uh in the mosh pits at fucking uh uh uh, uh what's the shit called? Um uh the shit they did uh Stop, stop. I like I know one jumped in to say no one wants to say no one wants to jump on the ledge of him. All right, Jarrell's pissed off about that, but hey, let, let, let's just leave it as that because he's talking about his ass. But let's let's go back to this, this article. So, festival fiasco, poorly organized events are putting you at risk. Um, in the post fire fire reality, events walk a tightrope between an ambitious ambiv- and oblivion, which you saw a lot with. Is this really the was um Tanakon the precursor of fire festival? I'm not too sure, but that whole idea that these individuals think that again i'm not too sure if it's because of no one's put on a club night but i've put on a few club nights right i've also put on a few parties in venues that weren't clubs and anyone that's put on a club night is also put on a party in a place that isn't a club or a bar you know how difficult the gap the gap in skill organization ability to put those two events is you know night and day let alone a festival let alone a festival let alone a festival right just just because already in a club night, you're already putting it in a bar or a club that has the facilities to accommodate you, right? It's usually a basement bar or a nice looking bar, great acoustic, the speakers are all set up, they've got an area for you to dance, they've got a bar already in place, they've got staff that can work there, security that usually work there. Like, there's really things in place that you can just add on to. A venue that doesn't do music or doesn't have a, a bar culture in it or something or whatever, a clubbing culture, you have to what? Clear out the furniture, maybe buy some furniture, paint a wall put a table down, hire equipment, hire staff to work there, hire, get get a bar, security. There's so many things to do, right? And that isn't even concerning the overall building, right? The, the toiletries and stuff that you have to do if you're doing a festival out in a park somewhere. It's insane level of work. It's insane. It's not just putting a, a couple of stages up, a, a couple of port, a port loose and just calling it a day, especially if you want people to come back. That's the problem people don't realise with festivals. Festivals, like, um, I think Houghton did the same thing, right? Houghton had, I think the only reason people were, were worried or complaining about Houghton, the first Houghton festival, I think, was the toilets. But overall, the vision of doing this amazing festival in a park somewhere, I think it's, in, I think it's outside of England, right? I mean, so outside of London. Uh, very scenic, um, kind of a hippie vibe. They pick some really cool, esoteric, eccentric, um, far-reaching, eclectic artists there. And it wasn't a stereotypical, like, you know, banger, banger, banger DJ. Really wide variety of, of people there. They have they had really good activities. They had yoga, meditation sessions. Like, a really cool vibe, right? And the only thing that got fucked up was the toilets. So then what happened happening, people were loyal to the thing and said, no, we see something in this festival, Houghton. We're going to come back again next year. What people that don't realize is that sometimes if you put a festival on with a good lineup, but you fuck up everything else, but the lineup is good, people won't come back again because they're like, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm not going to queue up for 17 hours, queue up for 17 hours to get in or to get a drink just to see my favorite artists play because it's not worth it overall and the overall bargain of a thing. So sometimes they don't realize that you only really get one shot at a festival. And then little by little, you die a death of a thousand cuts because people would still come because it's good value for money right paying 100 quid to go see like you know me at junction tomorrow i paid 35 pound for a two before 2 p.m ticket and i'm gonna go effectively go see i don't know six djs in one night right which is incredible because most of the djs if they played at a venue like xoy or fold or phonics and stuff i'll be playing 25 quid plus so i'm already you know i already made my money back seeing two people it's amazing so sometimes i, I don't know how why they're so um naive in that respect or they're so willful gleeful to kind of scam people when they know they're only going to get one shot at this ever again but anyway here we go um uh we the fun loving summertime festival goers are forced uh are faced by an all too common uh foe the overselling and understaffing of events again happens so many times especially in london especially in the uk it's so annoying um this firm must it's strange too because we're the nation of fucking festivals right we do open air festivals all the time every even boroughs do little summer fay things we have it in, in newham 
We go to West Ham Park or other places where they do these little summer fair, fun fair things that they have a you know a couple of rides, have a stage there. They, they, we always do these things. I don't know why suddenly now it's become like such a hard thing to kind of manage. But anyway, um, uh, the phone most commonly manifests as a stereotypical. I'm so bummed we weren't front row for Tyco. To this Porto line is longer than my grand's <laughs> mammy's feet. Surely it does. But these things are to be expected, understood, and are little consequence. Also, you never need to be in front row for Tyker. <laughs> My chief grievance relates to the increasingly frequent, where is the nearest hospital? Do you do by chance have any water? Which is strange, right? Again, water, Jesus Christ. It's a, that should be a, a flipping, you know, uh, I don't know. By um, Big name talent buying means diddly squat. If operations and infrastructure are unfunded, um, overworked and haphazardly supported, terrible things have happened under these conditions alone. Worse yet, certain production teams have risked the safety of patrons, staff and volunteers during climate disasters for the potential of profit and prestige. We are festival did exactly the same thing the other day and you know the, the founder seems like he doesn't give a fucking fuck. Um, Cancelled acts, long lines and torrential rainfall each have power to Ill- immutate tiny bopper rave biz- bunnies into a destructive mob of entitlement combine all these festival foes and ugly scenes occur rather quickly if the festival staff is wholly undertrained and ill-equipped to handle the fallout the risk rise exponentially after witnessing various blunders over the last years uh, from the uh, apocalyptic dy- dystopia of fire festival to treading water at tomorrow world's main stage and now infamous nightmare block weekender um, the fact that these events this has continued to happen is unsettling to say the least of course because you'd hope that over time really sometimes you have an event like i said houghton was a one way i think the toilets were fucked up or something happened there's one element of it but overall people saw the general vision and they got what they were trying to do like you know what this is the first time it got you know they're gonna iron out some chinks and then i think since then the like, last time went pretty well and then now they're having another festival that you know so far has sold out pretty has sold pretty well too so there is an element of patrons understanding when you're doing something the first time that it's not going to be correct or it's not going to be all the way perfect but some festivals just continually do shit and some of it i don't know if it has to do with the fact that you outsource everything a lot of teams do that right a lot of festival organizers just do it for a cash grab they book loads of people or do it as a form something to put in their cv um to kind of boost their profile so they can go work for a bigger company or bigger production team i don't know but maybe it's because they outsource everything and i think there's no central control i'm not too sure but some people are just really bad at putting on events too that might be it um it's no longer rock and roll and dungeon techno or red or renegade vibes when you're being evacuated from a Daigler warehouse flooded out to your tent or crushed by a barricade. Since the prevalence of massive festivals isn't going anywhere, it seems the event production industry has reached a necessary turning point. This is a video here. Uh, safe to say, we are festival will never happen again. People being trampled on barricades being thrown. Not enough minutes. I mentioned that the other day. This is a little video. Let's see what this is. Scary shit. Look at people just stampeding like... And this is all their fault, right? This is all their fault, what we are festival organization-wise. There's a video of people here just stampeding. There's barricades up bright that should be flat, right? And if you've seen those barricades, you know how dangerous they are because they've got on the edges. They're really sharply cut. Um, they're not smoothed over. Some of the edges are sharply cut, especially the feet. They're really sharp, especially the edges where they're meant to link uh, each barricade together. They're super sharp. So if that thing hits you in your skin, whilst you're outside in the sun, dehydrated, your skin is drying up, that you are you are bleeding a lot. Um, the 2019 festival season has barely begun and there's already some fresh examples of on-site tragedy. Uh, just within the past couple of weeks, um, we've seen two fiascos with panicked masses out of for their own necks over the next person. Seen during a stampede at We Are Festival along with riots at Governor's Ball. Um, both these incidents could and should be prevented but the fact that they weren't is a little surprise we are festival caused dismay a couple weeks ago when wait times to enter the event exceeded three hours patrons queued in extreme heat without access to shade or hydration stations the cause of delay the box office reportedly didn't have enough waistbands for the amount of tickets sold they closed the entry gate and well was jesus christ so they oversold the festival as they always do right that's why whenever you see someone saying online we are 99 percent sold 80 percent sold don't go to that festival right they're trying to oversell the festival they're trying to make more money instead of trying to um because we've all been to places where there is it's over capacity right and it's not fun you can't move around it's just not fun it's not the great environment that you want it to be you want it to be just right so the fact that they're over capacity and the fact that they don't have the staff to even facilitate over capacity is just crazy. So they want to make more money, but they don't want to spend more on staff, which is really, really bad. And there's a bit, and there's a, a picture online. This is from a girl called Chloe Jade Nichols. And this is the girl I posted the other day who's got a, now a massive scar on her leg. That I, I'm Because I remember people saying that we are festival, there was a girl, a blonde girl who had like a massive 
wound and it was pouring out of blood and she was kind of in and out of consciousness and i guess this must be the girl and she says here in a tweet thanks at we are festival and reese we are festival i think is the founder of it uh i'm pretty sure that is the founder dude right uh yep um uh, now scarred for life because you're incompetence and negligence not a single message saying sorry I've been coming to We Are Festival for years, spent so much money in there, and this is the treatment we received. I almost died as did others. Yeah, really disgusting, man. That's a massive scar for a girl two times on her leg because she went to a fucking festival. Like, insane. Um, so after baking for a few hours, the justifiably frustrated crowd inexcusably surged forward, toppling barricades while crushing attendees and security staff rendered ineffective, ineffectual and listless. Several attendees had to be hospitalized from injuries resulting from the stampede. Chloe Nicole, a 30 year old casino dealer and longtime attendee of the festival, suffered deep gash on her left leg after being struck by a barricade and then trampled. Nicole's waited nearly half an hour to be seen by medical staff before then being hospitalized to receive stitches on her injury. In speaking to reports of on the line nicole said i wish i was in so much pain i thought i was going to die so much for the joyous start to jesus christ man this is a textbook result of production failure if they had enough wristbands the cupid's remedy would have moved along swimmingly enough and the stampede would not have reverted that said there's also infrastructure and staffing failure infrastructure failed to provide enough shade on queues rarely available water and immovable box office barricades now again this goes to show just how um ignorant and silly and short-sighted and naive Tanner Montague was to throw Tanacon. Imagine this is We Are Festival who've done We Are Festival for a long time. Production team is, you know, say what you want about them. They've done they've done they've organized a festival a while, yeah? They've done it a, a few times. And they are having these issues. Imagine what Tanner could do with her friends. Yeah, she's got a good network of people to call upon, but she had the 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 cockiness that to think that she could throw a festival that would rival VidCon, right? <laughs> with all their issues too. VidCon had issues. They always have issues every year. You always see videos of, of kids complaining about VidCon. And let's see she somehow thought that she could do the same thing. Like crazy. Like I said, I think some people haven't done club nights. If you do one club night, right, and then you organize a party in a place that doesn't usually have um raves, you'll see how you then have a lot more respect for people that put on festivals. You honestly will do. There's no other way to say it. Like even just organize your own party in the fucking Nando's, right? Like, come on, man. Like, how hard is it to co-host people to come out to coordinate times, get tables and shit? And fuck me. Some people are just the self the delusion is just insane. Um the modest investment required to remedy these various ills equates to a silver of cost of needed to book a single headliner. To put it bluntly, we are first of all cared more about the optics at the top of their lineup than the patrons they wrangled like cattle to pay the bill. Ultimately, too, right? Sunday shenanigans at Governor's Ball could have been easily avoided as well, though admittedly at a greater cost. However, warnings had been readily broadcast throughout the day. The Governor's Ball production team anticipating a high likelihood of catastrophe thunderstorm the afternoon. There was similar chance of another bad evening. They held the gates closed until the, the dam. The dawn near sundown and light on warnings before deciding to risk it all. At the buzzer, the gates finally opened at 6 p.m. A mandatory evacuation was issued at 9.35 p.m. Unfortunately uh, for the event producers, but more for attendees, Bedlam broke out after the event was cancelled, which compounded on itself in the face of an extreme weather pattern. Festival girls were trapped at Radlands Island, huddled un together under overpass. And then people were just smashing into these fucking things that governors bore, isn't it, right? These passive things are... Uh, it's just true though, right? Once once the organization is poor and the kids have nothing to do and they're stuck in some place, cattle uh herded like cattle, there's no there's no other thing they're gonna do but just smash everything around them, right? <laughs> Bloody hell. In an AMA hosted by Reddit yesterday, the governor's board production executive addressed the many concerns um, earnest and in-depth fashion. The most pointed criticism came from the, of the security staff. Multiple attendees reported a disjointed message coming from security. The main stage emergency exits were blocked off by before the evacuation, which forced the crowd into a slow-moving bottleneck. In response to this qualm, one of the production teams named Tom replied, for the weather we were experiencing, the specific plan for severe weather event does not call for emergency exit to be used, but rather to instruct people to leave through the main entry and exit. This defeats the point of having emergency in it in the first place. Um, a Redditor dubbed uh, Footcramp95 wrote his this cheeky message. Maybe if God Ball was more of a music festival and less of a dis dis designated Instagram convention, this would be less of a problem, which is true. Music industry landscape has become a fraught enterprise since the dawn of the internet, now being predominantly reliant on performances over record sales. As a result, many festivals have been forced to adopt a do-or-die mentality. If an event it doesn't sell out, the necessary nest egg to produce future events is 
oftentimes lots, which is true, right? Uh, so many festivals so far have been cancelled in because they haven't sold out, which is insane to think that you have to sell out to in order to kind of have, especially considering the amount of festivals that are going on. Festival season used to start now. Now it's starting in fucking March, right? Sometimes February. It's like insane. It goes all the way into October. It's fucking insane how long it goes. Um, in the post five festival reality, nobody wants to end up in the backlash received by Jaro and Billy McFarland. Even so, many production companies are forced to walk the same tightrope between ambition and oblivion that play countless events before them. The answer seems simple, though. Uh, production teams need to place a greater priority, i.e. funding, on the integrity of their staff, the strength of their infrastructure and foresight of disaster planning. This also means that artists need to accept a more proportional share of the proverbial pie. Asking for a multi-billion dollar deal for a couple of hours of time is well and good insofar as a crowd paying the bill isn't in danger by attendance which is true right so they're saying that festivals artists need to accept that festivals will pay less money because they're having to spend more money on infrastructure right which is true because you don't want to go to a festival the bad the worst thing to be an artist is to go to a festival play have an amazing set the people at the front who are having a good time are having a great time you're unaware of what's going on outside or over the left hand side you're just concentrating on the people in front of you and you get on twitter and people are saying oh I, I, i'm so sorry i missed you uh this festival was awful i got crushed my leg got ripped open like that will make you feel so horrible right that you went there to go play to connect with your fans or to gain new audiences and all they can remember is the fact that they couldn't hear you it was too low and they got crushed on, on the way to seeing you play it's like that's not the right way to go about things um uh, blah, 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 ensuring, blah, blah, blah. ensuring the infrastructure and operational staff is able to effectively support an event should always come before paying out a headlining act it's the responsibility of production teams to make the judgment in parallel if a dangerous weather pattern is forecast the fat cats at the top uh, need to cancel some dates and eat their losses which is true simple event production is always a gamble especially with outdoor venues and the rising threat of climate change there are no guarantees in the words of George Hall, one of the founders of Block Weekender, no one likes the idea of that promoters are gambling with your money, but the alternative is that they are run by a very large face organizations. While this is true, producers aren't only taking liberties. It's true, but again, promoters gambling with your money is still, promoters still need to have a level of, you know, expertise or professionalism or just wanting to do a good job, right? You can't just say because I'm a promoter, things are going to go wrong. I'm not a face organization. Just get people in to help you out then. Do you know what I mean? Do the job properly. Plan it ahead of time. Maybe concentrate on doing it a one-day festival instead of a two-day festival, right? Just try and make that work. And again, maybe there might be the education needed for the consumer too. Instead of having a festival stacked with the top 100 DJs rated by DJ Mike, maybe have a festival with some lesser known acts, some local acts, some people that are on the B, C tier. And people can, but then again, people don't back that in it. People want to just go see the big, glitz, glitz, glitzy people. Like, I, like I'm saying with Junction, I'm effectively paying, I'm effectively eager to go because it's, you know, in relation to the guests that they have on and what i'm paying it works out really well so i don't know man. i'm not too sure maybe it's a it's a it's a conversation that needs everyone's participation right in that respect uh the well privileged for you to yeah but yeah it's a good article i recommend you check it out um i'll link it in the show notes for you guys that want to see it it's called festival fiasco poorly organized events are putting you at risk and it's written by one mix mac ba, 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 ba. what else is next here uh, what else we talk about? Oh yeah, this. Let's just let's talk about this because I think this is interesting. So somebody created Burkhine on Minecraft. Have you seen that? Fucking awesome. Minecraft is a game that a lot of people have been playing lately, right? I haven't actually played it, um, but somebody has recreated the um, uh, Burkhine architecture and interior <laughs> entirely on Minecraft, and it brings back so many memories. I'm so absolutely stoked on this one. Incredibly, incredibly good video. Um, so far, it's unlisted. It's got over 100,000 views. And yeah, I found it on the Techno subreddit. That's like I said, go to the Techno subreddit. It's probably one of my best places to go visit on the internet, hands down down and again it brings back so many good memories man like i haven't walked through this entrance usually i come from the the top where the taxi kind of stops out but this is the front of Bergheim. it's completely created <laughs> on these 2d graphics the queue going past the barricades looking up the entrance where this is this this is the most important place ever for you when you're standing right here actually the most important place might be just in the queue actually because you get told quite often that you shouldn't make any noise you shouldn't laugh and joke I've done that before and I've gotten in plenty of times. The only time I haven't gotten in is when I've been in a group of four lads and we kind of look laddie and it hasn't worked out that way too often. But um, usually if you stand in the queue and you're talking to your friends and you look cool, people will let you in regardless. But this is the most important part because if it's Sven, usually they say if it's Sven, it's a bit more strict, but I've, he's let me in a couple of times too. So I wouldn't say that. Um, this is just where you kind of get told a nine or go in whatever, yeah, or not tonight or nine, one of them, right? And then, um, yeah, so if you're lucky enough to get in, boom, 
and here's where you get searched. I have so many nostalgic memories here. The tables, there's usually two security guards here. We might ask you to empty out your bag on the table um, to you get searched. And here's where you kind of buy your ticket and get your stamp. You walk through here. This this is where it starts getting amazing because when you walk in through, when you come out there, security to come get no, when you come and get his ticket and you walk around, you start to hear it boom. But it's not super loud. Just the, the the industrial architecture. You see people sitting along the all the benches here, talking, chatting around. See people in amazing outfits. And then you walk down here. You see the cloakroom that's flicking incredible. Loads of rails there. People handing over their stuff and you paying them. I think a couple of euros to put your stuff in. I've never gone up those stairs. Not sure what the door is next to the change room. You hand over your jacket and coat, and then you walk in again. Jacket and coat always hand it in because there's no place to put your stuff down. People don't really put their stuff down inside in Bergheim. Usually everything's going in the cloakroom, and usually a lot of club kids in there, so everyone wants to show out their outfits. So you don't want to hold anything. So I advise if you're going to Bergheim, have because it's weird because in London we have an outfit in mind in a club that includes our jacket or hoodie. When you go out to an actual club, especially in Bergheim or in Berlin when it's hot during the summer and it's absolutely humid and it's stuffy and it's, you're going to sweat like a pig, it's advantageous to have an outfit. That you're gonna wear in the club like an, a club outfit right t-shirt vest shorts topless whatever it may be so you come in here and then usually as you walk through there's a sculpture here i think it's a dude pissing or something right the massive sculpture there he wasn't probably able to create and then this leads you up to the berghain uh main hall so you walk around here i'm assuming right uh i think you're up the stairs massive stairs to really wide space so be careful there and then you just hear this is this is the bit where i saw harvey playing it's just like insane there's two platforms there dance on i was getting insane on the dj booth for the corner there Ugh, the dreams of playing here one day man it'll be so cool you'll be really awesome what he did this guy did if he ended up deciding to uh uh, host people playing there online like in different rooms you could actually stand in there and play like kind of like sims and you book djs to play there that'd be fucking cool that'd be really really awesome to do i'm not sure how possible that is we'll be able to do but it would work out really well obviously the dark rooms that you know you go into and you're like whoa the first time again the stage is amazing incredibly high ceilings like ah oh. it's easily one of the best clubs in the world like architecturally wise right it's just amazing right the bar there's so many bars everywhere all over the place um i think this is leading up to panorama bar i haven't been up these stairs actually before uh, this is another view to go up to the panorama bar there's another bar down there just insane the level of work that got that went into doing this man just so cool again more of the same with the bar as well here's panorama bar i think at the top as well my one of my favorite bits in Bernheim, place that i kind of usually kind of go to for the most part because first had all the house techno house disco djs playing in there but yeah an incredible video i recommend you check i'll link it in my show notes it's it's it's, it's called by a guy called uh, please don't ban me um again i'll link you in my show so you guys check out but i really recommend you see it it's a really cool video it really again brings back loads of memories really makes me nostalgic about going back to berlin sooner rather than later and again it's a real good because i don't think people have an idea of what it looks like on the inside i don't think so right um i think if you haven't been in there there's not many no there's pictures of it on the inside are from the architecture firm that designed the Berghain um and panorama bar but there isn't any kind of pictures or videos of people actually going in like a live tour so you have to be you have to have been in there to have known it. and plus when you see a picture you don't have no context of what it's going to look like but this brings back a lot of memories but again it's part of me it's like if you're a new person you haven't been there before it might be advantageous maybe not to watch this video i think actually going in there with no reference of what it's going to look like is is more impactful that's happened to me i did all my research i was on the forums i was checking things out i checked the floor plan i was before the first time i went but when i went in there for the first time it still blew me away right because i had no context for what the stairs looked like the textures the smells the toilets the bar the cloakroom it's just always that fresh experience sometimes i think what these things are great but again it's a game you know it's a 2d graphics it's you know it's fairly basic it's not going to give you any sort of life of what it looks like but it does give you a good idea if you've been there it does really make you smile but i think if you haven't been there it might be attention for me not to watch it and just kind of go in there blind and then kind of watch this again when you come back out and you're like ah oh, the good old days but yeah incredible video uh, made by this dude I really recommend you check it out really recommend check it out anyway that's an hour man that's an hour that's one hour result Thank you for tuning in to the Excellent Zinger Show, episode number 205. As always, more information regarding me, check out my website, excellentzinger.com. You can find that in the show notes below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review so people find my podcast. If you're watching via the YouTube, like and subscribe and all that malarkey. Leave me a comment if you have any questions. And I will see you guys again very, very soon for another episode of the show. For another episode of the show, I always rush my words towards the end, isn't it? Anyway, take care, guys. Have a good one. Peace.